Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the pod. Hey, YouTube. Hey, everybody. I feel like uh, the when this comes out, it will be like January 1st. Happy 2024. Um, Happy New Year. Um, I hope We're you guys enjoyed our holiday episode. That was fun. That was fun. We're coming at you with some upgraded sound as well for the new year. So somebody tell us you can notice a difference so we don't think it's a waste of time and money, but we upgraded. We're both using mics, so we should sound a little bit different in your ear holes. Hopefully we sound like those really like, I don't want to say it's like ASMR, but like hopefully we sound like those really easy to listen to podcasts where the voices just like flow and you get like a really nice sound. There's no, hopefully there's never any crying toddlers in the background, but you know, it's always a risk over here. They'll have to give us some feedback too. Like if it's too loud, like we'll have to listen back as well. But if you have any feedback on the sound, let us know. Cause we, uh, as much as we've been podcasting for years, we still don't really know what we're doing. So let us know. It's funny because I feel like it seems so difficult. And then when you get into it, it's actually very simple. But then there's like a whole other level of like what you could be doing. Yeah. Um, which let's face it, we don't really have time for that. We barely have time for what we do. Um, and uh, we're not looking to monetize this. Um, well, actively, nice. we're not actively trying to monetize yeah. this, right? We're not, we're not Jason and Travis Kelsey over here. Like we don't have the viewership to, uh, to warrant putting extra, but, uh, you know, if there are suggestions, we will take them. Yeah. And I think upgrading the sound is just a nice little way to, I know it just, especially since we record virtually, I think having good sound. So hopefully somebody tell us you notice a difference because I made Jess pull out her mic. So if you're sitting there being like, yeah, you sound exactly the same. Um, don't tell me that. Um, the thing is, is there's really no excuse. It was just me being lazy. So like, we did it. Um, do you have a win for the week? I do. And it's podcast related and it's from last week actually. But um, so backstory and I don't remember if I mentioned this or not backstory is that something happened with the platform that we use that it was having it couldn't pull the audio off of the video because we record in a call and it used to just do that and upload it and it was great and I added our intros and you know all those things that you hear every single time and then it didn't work and I was on with like their customer service and I was like what happened? And they were like, oh, it looks like there's a problem. Like our engineers are working on it. And I was like, do you have an estimated like whatever, but it just never got fixed. And I thought we had time because we were so ahead. And then it came up to and we we're like, crap. So your girl over here, Google. No, Google helped. <laughs> I found a website to pull audio off of the video and save it to my computer and upload it all by myself. And I, and I, cause Jill, when we were talking about it, when she was here recording and, um, I texted her and I was like, I fucking did it. In all we love it. Um, which that's the one win. But the second one is that I've actually sort of taken that moment and used it with some of my clients to reframe what success looks like, um, yeah. over the past few weeks. Cause it's very busy. People are like getting down on themselves for, um, not exercising, things like that. And um, one of the phrases I've been using is, what would it take for in the next few days for you to text me, I fucking did it the way that I texted Jill. Um, and it's worked. So winning on all that. accounts. We love that. Yeah, we love a tech win. Because like I said, as much as we've been podcasting for a quick minute, we're not tech people and we're not professional podcasters when things go sideways we're just kind of like uh somebody help so i'm glad you were able to start it and <laughs> um there's a big window right here and a bird just like flew and kind of fluttered it didn't crash into the window but it just like fluttered around the window and like freaked me out it was like a giant <laughs> magpie so if you saw that on youtube wow jess is not being murdered it's okay i had that moment the other day because I live on the 24th floor so birds aren't usually up here and this bird landed on my deck the other day when I was sitting in my living room and I 
was like, oh, I'm about to be murdered. And then I was like, oh, it's just a bird. Never mind. <laughs> so I feel your pain. Um, um, I'm actually yeah, a little bit afraid of birds. Like, I do not like them. Too. So, um, yeah, that was terrifying. I also <laughs> don't do birds. Um, this is a little bit of a self care win. And I will shout out my massage therapist, Natalie, if you're in. Edmonton or Shred Park and you need a massage therapist. She's awesome. She was actually my first ever holistic client, fun fact. And now um, she's my massage therapist. So it's been cool to literally watch her create her business. But um, we finally got in a routine with each other. She does the workout club. I get a massage every month. And it's just like a nice little piece of self-care. And as much as I would love to be the person that would be like, oh, I would do it even if we weren't product swapping, I probably wouldn't because I just don't make the time for it. And that's just not something mm-hmm. I prioritize. Um, but having that trade-off of like one for one, because it almost works perfectly if you're a business owner, mm-hmm. product swapping either works really good or really not good. And it's almost exactly the same monetary amount to do a month of the workout club and a massage. So we love that. But it's been like three months of me getting a massage every month and I feel like I feel like it's just making a difference it's making my life a little bit easier it's nice to like carve out an hour every month to be like I'm going and doing the thing um I schedule around it and it just feels nice to have a little bit of my like self-care routine back in my life yeah I agree I feel when I go for regular massages um I'm just like that much better. Like my body feels better. Like I get less headaches. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And it's just not something I usually prioritize. So it was nice. She reached out to me and I was like, don't pay me. Can we just product swap instead? Because I was like, then it holds me accountable on the other side. So it feels nice to be back in your routine with it. Like have something little to look forward to every month because I made a post it would have been a while ago now about like finding joy in the smaller moments and I just think mm-hmm. that's a little way to create joy in your life is like whether it's getting your nails done or your eyelashes or whatever your version of that is it's nice to have that set in a schedule every month totally totally agree um, right. but <laughs> what are we talking about oh. we're talking about pregnancy today Ooh, i mean yeah i could still say woo not pregnancy related to either of us to be clear um oh, no just this in is a general, not an announcement there's no announcements to be made over here but pregnancy in general we had a couple of people ask about pregnancy and myths and all the things um and i just think it's never it's never a bad topic i feel like um on at least on the fitness side of things, a lot of things are starting to change. Um, and I'm going to share some updates from some people that I work closely with behind the scenes. Um, and some of the things might surprise you. So it's always good because there is actually research happening in this field now, which is so cool. It is cool. Because previously it hasn't really happened. Um, but there is a lab in Edmonton at the U of A and it's run by a very awesome person Marky Davenport and she's spearheading so many cool things with pregnancy and postpartum I don't even know where to start she's um, a cool lady I met her at the CSEP conference in Calgary um, last yeah. year and my hairdresser slash cousin I don't think she listens to the pod um, but she actually participated in the like high intensity exercise study she did when she was pregnant so i have done several surveys that they have put out and i just finished um submitting my um thoughts on uh one of the studies that's coming out uh they asked for some help um with the language and what people thought like what industry people thought of like the the objective, the abstract, like all those things that kind of come before they put the actual data in the study. So that was kind of neat. Um, yeah. So let's get into it, Jill. What are some of our pregnancy myths? Uh, we're going to do some for nutrition and some for training because I feel like it kind of covers across the board. I will put a disclaimer. I'm not talking about supplements today. I'm not. That's a whole different conversation. That's a whole different wheelhouse. Um, I also think that's very nuanced. And we don't have enough time 
for no. that. And it's it's a hard before anyone's like Jill, just talk about it. It's hard to talk about because there's not a ton of research in the holistic world to begin with, let alone combine like supplements holistic with pregnancy because not very many women want to be the guinea pig of like let's see if this supplement yeah. does terrible things and, so and ultimately ultimately it does come down to a little bit of like risk versus reward so for example just as an example there has been a little bit of research suggesting that creatine can be beneficial from brain development but we don't know for sure. So it's probably best to just be like, let's pass on that during pregnancy. Everything, That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Everything's pretty great. I remember when you were pregnant and you were dealing with heartburn and I sent you the liquid aloe because mm. it's one of those things. A lot of things around supplements in pregnancy are like, it should be safe, but we don't really know. So exactly as you said, it's that like risk versus reward. Like liquid aloe is like, it could be, or it could cause premature contractions. So it's like, which, yeah. which I way do you want to go? I don't think I ended up taking it. No, um, I think I just did a little bit of like planning around eating and laying down. Yeah. But that's the, <laughs> I mean, ultimately the only thing that got rid of my heartburn was childbirth. <laughs> yeah. And that's a big thing with pregnancy. So I just wanted to say before anyone's like, why isn't she talking about supplements? Because there's too much gray area. There's too much. What if I am not a doctor? Um, and I, no offense, do not want to be responsible for telling you it should be fine to take something and then it's not. So, um, but we are going to talk about fitness and nutrition. Mm -hmm. I Googled what the number one nutrition myth is around pregnancy. And I don't think this is super surprising, but the number one myth is that you need to eat for two. Um, um, which, yeah, I think, I think most most people will be like, yeah, that's not true. Um, but honestly, it probably comes from like the boomer generation more than it does like people around our age. There would be like, oh, like you must be eating for two or like, you know, nothing counts when you're pregnant or like people will always say things like that. Um, I also think, and this is no like shade towards women i also think a big piece of that is almost justifying it like i know mm -hmm. during pregnancy like you deal with like cravings and things like that i do think a part of that and probably why a lot of people lean into it is that justification of like well i'm pregnant so i'm allowed to eat whatever i want or i'm pregnant so i can eat as much as i want and like yeah you can you can do whatever you want but i also have heard people kind of use it on that end too of being like well i can eat three mcdonald's cheeseburgers every night because i'm growing a baby like i hear oh that God, that would have like destroyed me but i hear that a lot from pregnant people too and again no shame do whatever you want while you're pregnant but i think it comes as like justification for maybe our not great nutrition choices while pregnant <laughs> yeah totally um and i don't know the exact numbers uh but I believe you max out in the third trimester at 400 extra calories to help that little baby out. So yeah. I just um, that's, like up. A, that's like a couple snacks. Yeah, I just pulled it up. Um, it says typically women who begin pregnancy um, need 200, 400 calories more per day during the second trimester. So um, somebody's not going to like this, but in the first trimester, you don't actually need any more calories. Um, and in additional 400 calories per day during the third trimester. So if you were doing like 200 per day in the second, then you would be at like 600 calories by the third. Um, but that's not that much. And this is from like the CDC. Um, so it's actually research, not just a Wikipedia opinion. Um, but I don't think people realize how little that is. Like you hear 400 mm -hmm. to 600 calories because that's what we're topping out at. And people are like, that's so much extra food. It's not, it might be like an extra wrap or a couple extra snacks or like throw some extra Greek yogurt in your smoothie. Like 200 to 600 calories doesn't actually get you that far. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, it was my experience, I 
I didn't really crave much. I would just like, cause I'm not really somebody who was like, oh my God, I would die for like a taco right now. Um, I would just kind of be like, oh, that sounds good. Sure. Okay. I did have a lot of booster juice though. Um, so I was, in, I was a big fruit person. I feel like pregnant. every pregnant person has their thing. Like there's one thing where- well, maybe You know what? I haven't had a booster juice since. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I think everyone when they're pregnant has like one thing that they like only consume when they're pregnant and then it just like disappears out of their life mm -hmm. for the rest of it. Yeah. So, uh, but I think like, do you need more calories? Yes. yes. Do we need as many as maybe we justify? Probably not. But I also think how we choose to go about that is important um which kind of leans into i'll just knock two out right off the bat yeah. because they kind of yeah. go together um is that nutrition doesn't matter during pregnancy it just matters to eat more and then it also doesn't matter for breastfeeding so we what they mean by that is like doesn't matter what you eat it just matters how much you eat yeah you should definitely be supporting any activity that you're doing. So if you are exercising, we want to make sure that we're taking care of your protein needs, you know, like all those things. Um, I feel like uh, it's a great time to shift to like thinking about like, um, like nutrient density, right? I don't like saying healthy versus unhealthy, thinking about things like that, because we're, you're allowed to have treats and things like that that are less nutrient dense but it is a great time to be like can we get some like big leafy green salads with lots of stuff on them can we fuel our bodies really well for the event in however many months that we are going to go through yeah um and it's don't... often like pregnancy is often compared to a marathon um, so if you think about it like that, like I know as an athlete, I found that kind of easy to think about, um, that I was training for something. Um, I know you're like, you can't train for birth, but like in your mind you can. Like, I also think there's things you can do to make it a little bit easier for yourself, probably. Totally. And I think, I don't think it ever, it always matters what we eat. I always say, even in terms of like fat loss or my nutrition clients, like, how much we eat determines whether we lose fat or not. What we eat determines how we feel while we're mm. doing that. And I think that applies universally, whether you have, whether you're pregnant or you have a mm. physical or whatever it may be, what we eat determines the size of our body or how much we eat determines the size of our body. What we eat determines how we feel in our body. And that can apply to energy, hunger, digestion, mood, strength in the gym. So I think as a whole, we should get away from the narrative of like nutrition doesn't matter. It's just amount of food. I think nutrition always matters and we can make a lot of choices and decisions on how we feel through the foods we're eating. And we miss a big mark if we don't think the food we eat impacts everything else we do. Yeah. And especially um, if you are newly pregnant and you're listening to this and you're going through um, like whether you're having nausea or even if you are somebody who's dealing with hyperemesis, um, you'll want to be choosing foods when you do feel like eating that are nutrient dense, that your body can do something with. I know all you want to do is eat like the crackers and things like that. But, and I think we've talked about this before. Somebody had asked us a question about how to eat when you don't feel like eating. A smoothie is a great way to pack in nutrients when you don't feel like eating. Um, I think that might have been why I drank a lot of booster juice. Um, it's just like, it's just like nutrient dense calories that you need. And I mean, you guys all know that I exercised quite a bit, so I probably needed to have those extra supports. Well, on a smoothie, there. like anything, so without getting too much into digestion, digestion starts when we chew. So if you're not mm -hmm. experiencing a lot of appetite or a lot of hunger, smoothies are a way to work around that because it doesn't register the same in our brains. 
the opposite is also true. If you're experiencing a lot of hunger, you want to try to eat foods that you actually have to chew because that is a big part of triggering our brain that like, hey, we're eating food now. Um, smoothies, you usually don't have to chew. I hope you're not having to chew your smoothie. Um, eat a new blender yeah. if you have to chew. <laughs> you do you. Um, but just <laughs> drinking calories, because at the end yeah. of the day, that's what a smoothie is, doesn't register the same in our body as actually like chewing food. So um, it's kind of a, there's two sides to that. You can work around low appetite by using smoothies. Um, but if you're having high appetite, you probably want to actually chew your food. Um, and especially for breastfeeding, nutrition, a thousand percent matters. There's lots of foods. I could do a whole nother episode on this, but there are so many foods that can help increase your milk stores, help increase lactation, help support your supply more. Healthy fats are really important. Like there's a lot we can do. Again, that's not to say like breastfeeding won't happen if you don't pay attention to nutrition. Um, but with anything, there's a lot we can do with the food we eat to impact. Yeah. How and, and we know that there's sort of a cycle of like you really want this feeding situation to happen. It's not happening as you would thought you're stressed. That also has an impact on it too. So if we can fuel your body, at least we can take, that is something we can control um, rather than, you know, like sometimes we can't control your milk supply. Sometimes we can't control the baby's latch. Sometimes we can't control if they have a tongue tie or like, you know, all these other factors um and nutrition is something we can control so if there are things that you can control when it comes to pregnancy and childbirth and having a newborn control the things that you can and yeah. try to chill about the other things but i know that it's hard side note about tongue ties i think in canada we should be better at checking for tongue, t tongue ties because did you know this is a weird fun fact only because as an adult i learned i had a tongue tie um, in like Europe and stuff, like they check every baby for a tongue tie before mm -hmm. they send them home. And we don't do that here. Um, usually you'll notice if your baby, baby has a tongue tie because it can't latch properly if you're breastfeeding or I don't know, I'm not a mom, but there's like if they're not digesting properly or whatever, there's a bunch of signs as tongue ties, but they don't check at the hospital all the time. Sometimes they do. So I have some interesting thoughts about tongue ties. Um one thing is that midwives do check. We love that. Another thing is that um, the tongue tie industry from a dentist perspective is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so don't be afraid to get a second opinion if you're not sure. Um, because we were told that my kiddo has a tongue tie. Um, she does not have a tongue tie. She, I did not. So full disclosure, I did not breastfeed. Um, we formula fed the whole time. And we just said, like, I was like, she's two weeks old. I do not want this stress in my life of trying to figure this thing out. So let's just see how she feeds and we'll deal with it if she has troubles. And she never did. She doesn't have speech problems. Um, she has been checked by a pediatric dentist and she doesn't have anything. So that. use your mama's intuition a little bit there. And I did ask my midwife about tongue ties because I was like, here's the thing. There wasn't really a thing when we were kids. I mm -hmm. never knew anybody. Although some people are adults and they have them released. Why are we seeing every other baby with a tongue tie? My midwife, I don't know if this is true, but it seems like a good theory to me is that prenatal vitamins have come a long way. Mm -hmm. And it is possible that we are building better and more connective tissue and it is a connective tissue. So this could be why this is happening. Um, it's not a bad thing. It's just like a result of being a better 3D printer. I'm 26 years old and I have a tongue tie and I'm still functioning just fine. But it took me until like 22 for my orthodontist to be like, or not my orthodontist, my hygienist to be like, you know why your teeth move all the time? And I was like, no, because like I've had braces, I did the retainers, I did all the things and all my teeth have shifted again. 
and she was like you have a tongue tie like no your dentist has never told you this and i was like no which <laughs> makes sense because until i get my tongue tie clipped i will continue i will have to continue to get like orthodontics work done which means or money for the orthodontist so right. my hygienist was like why has no one told you you have a tongue tie so you can go get it clipped as an adult i haven't because i'm scared um even though it's probably not that I big of a deal yeah she's like you literally just like don't talk for like two days and then you're fine you have to do um, physio exercises yeah but like she didn't tell me like she's like well no wonder your teeth are the way they are and like you have plaque and stuff because your tongue can't clean your teeth properly like i can't with my mouth closed i can't touch the top of my mouth and i can't reach my back molars with my tongue and oh my god right fun fact about jill so she was like well no kidding you have like the dental and i don't have many dental issues but like my teeth shift because my tongue presses mm -hmm. against the back of my teeth 24 7. it doesn't sit where it's supposed to because of my tongue tie so the more you yes. know Fun fact, your tongue is supposed to rest on the roof of your mouth. Yeah, no, mine's against the back of my bottom teeth 24-7. And I literally can't, like, oh. you're supposed to be able to close your mouth and reach your back molars. I don't even get close. That's crazy to me. Jeez, man. Okay. Anyways, really this tired. is taking Anywho. a turn. But, Tangent um... on tongue ties. <laughs> We're back. Uh, go for an exercise one. That was two nutrition ones. So what do we got on the exercise? Um, one? one of the exercise ones is that you either shouldn't exercise or you shouldn't start anything new if you are currently not exercise and then you find yourself pregnant. A lot of people, they're like, ah, oh, I really should like get a little bit healthier physically before, yeah. you know, this comes or they're like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have the endurance to sustain childbirth situation, all those kinds of things. Um, and that is absolutely not true. You can start a exercise program. You can even start a higher intensity exercise program. It doesn't have to be keep your heart rate below 150 beats per minute anymore. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, don't lift anything over your head or anything over 20 pounds. Um, there's actually some new sort of train of thought um, coming back to what we started talking about at the beginning is that, and here's a question, is it actually more dangerous to do nothing during pregnancy than it is to exercise? Is being deconditioned during pregnancy setting you up for failure postpartum? Yeah. I'd say, I say hard yes. I would agree. Hard and I yes. think a big part of that is the fear mongering around like what's yes. it gonna do to the baby like nothing the baby's gonna be fine <laughs> and i say that with honestly your baby is protected in there there is lots of fluid there is lot even if you like trip over a dumbbell and like smash your face into the floor your baby's probably gonna be okay yeah and those like i get probably the fear, the nervousness of like, if you weren't someone who worked out before, like, yeah, maybe we're not entering a CrossFit competition while we're pregnant, but like, we can probably go to the gym with a trainer if that makes you more comfortable and do some squats and go for walks and like do the things and gain that confidence because you're going to have to do all those things while you're pregnant. Anyways, I think we always forget that a lot of the movement we do in the gym mimics everyday life. You do a mm -hmm. setup or you do a squat most times when you have to bend down or you hinge like lots of those movement patterns we're doing day to day. Yeah. And if we can make ourselves stronger in those movement patterns, it's going to reduce your risk for a lot of other things. And I think if your fear is falling while you're pregnant, strength training can help that not happen. Absolutely. And a couple things there is if you're going to start working out, what a what better time than to find a prenatal or postpartum fitness specialist and work with them to get a plan for you that is designed with pregnancy in mind. Not that I'm not saying that there's safe and unsafe exercises. We can't say that anything is truly safe during pregnancy. Um, but we know that most things are not unsafe. Um, the other thing is that when you are growing, as you get further into your pregnancy, you need your muscles and your tendons and your ligaments to support extra weight. Mm -hmm. So if you do not train, you are probably going to be more susceptible to low back pain, pelvic girdle pain, things like that. And it has actually been shown 
that having pelvic girdle pain, um, if you have pelvic girdle pain, sorry, exercise can actually be helpful for that rather than rest, which has been the traditionally what has been prescribed to you in the past. Um, so super cool learning new things about that every day. Um, I was going to say something else about. I think the biggest thing like working when we worked at the studio, we did, like we came in contact with a lot of mm -hmm. pre and postnatal women. That was kind of, kind of the gig over there. <laughs> um, and I think the biggest thing is just like that fear and working past it and realizing that like, you're going to be fine. And I think the mm -hmm. biggest quote issue and you can chime in if you disagree but I think the biggest issue I ran into with working with women that were pregnant was just like the act of having a belly like maybe we're using mm -hmm. dumbbells instead of barbells and like movements look a little bit different and things like that but it doesn't mean you can't do them it just means we might need to change what we're doing them with or the way we do them in to make it more comfortable while pregnant. Yeah, absolutely. Positional changes, breathing changes even can make things feel a little bit better for you. One thing that I was going to mention in that is people will often blame relaxin mm -hmm. for pain as you get further in pregnancy. Here's a humdinger for you. <laughs> relaxin. So if you don't know what relaxin is, it is a hormone that um, makes your ligaments more pliable to Helps allow you push out a baby. Well, actually, your uterus does that, but um, but well. <laughs> relaxin peaks at 12 weeks pregnant. So don't come to me when you're 35 weeks pregnant and be like, oh, it's the relaxin that's making me sore. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. You've had never done that. They already have so many weeks. So basically what I'm saying is if your joints are kind of loosey goosey to begin with, um, it's not pregnancy's fault. You were probably like that pre-pregnancy. Yeah. You might just notice it more when yeah. pregnant. So strength training is absolutely the answer. Yeah. Relaxin is not to blame. No. You have to um, here first. Yeah. And we worked, you continue to, I still, I work with women, so they fall pregnant often. It's kind of how life goes. Um, fall pregnant? You sound like yeah. a, sound like a romance novel. Well, she fell pregnant. I, I'm at the age still where like my friends are pregnant and I'm like, you're like, do is I it say congratulations? congratulations or am I like, I'm like, do we need to fix this? Or like, is it a congratulations? Honestly, What's happening honestly, honestly, as somebody who's like an, an elder millennial, even when so a friend tells me that they're pregnant, oftentimes the reaction is shit. Yeah. Not yay. And like, I'm at the <laughs> age where like people are attempting, like they're trying to get pregnant on purpose, but on anytime, purpose. anytime I see like someone my age post that they're like, pregnant, I'm like, teen pregnancy. I'm like, oh no. And then I'm like, you're 26 years old, Jill. People are doing that on purpose. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, if you have a friend that fell pregnant, I'm just going to say that now, um, you can send them this episode if they're having a little panic about all the things that come with pregnancy. Um, these are two quick ones, and I think some of the most common uh, nutrition ones around pregnancy is that you're not allowed to drink coffee, um, which many studies have shown that's not true, especially if you were a coffee drinker pre-pregnancy. It's not having any effect. There's actually studies that have come out in general showing, because I know for regular people too, everyone's like, coffee dehydrates you. Negative. There's new studies that have come out showing that if you're a regular coffee drinker, caffeine is not dehydrating you. Your body is used to it. Your body compensates by holding on to the water it needs to. It's not dehydrating you. So that's not going to happen during pregnancy either. And I do know there's guidelines around pregnancy and like caffeine. And you probably don't want to be consuming like thousands of milligrams I of caffeine. I believe it's 200 milligrams. 200 or 250 is the number that comes to my brain. Um, yeah, I will says, also say that it might be, if you're a current coffee drinker and you find yourself with child, I'm going to say with child and you're going to say fell pregnant. If you find yourself with child and you are thinking about giving up caffeine, let's consider the stress that giving up the caffeine might have on your body might be worse. Than don't sign me up for in withdrawing your from caffeine while pregnant. That's we're not um, doing, I'm not doing and it. And anecdotally, 
do as I say, not as I do. I think I probably teetered around a little bit more than 200 milligrams a day. Um, and I also heard that if I drank too much coffee, I would have a hyperactive baby. I did not experience that. Um, it's also a so thing that like, when I was younger, like people used to say that I was short because my mom drank coffee while she was pregnant, but like stunt your yeah, growth that makes sense. thing. And I'm like, or it's the fact isn't that my that mom. What, isn't that what grownups tell kids that coffee don't will do coffee. if yeah. they don't do it? Yeah. Or it's the <laughs> fact that my mom's five foot nothing, but sure. We'll blame caffeine for that one. Um, all genetics. Yeah. It did. It did say that like 200 is about the recommended limit while pregnant but again with coffee who's to say how much caffeine is in your cup of coffee it's going to depend you know, on what you you're honestly, drinking are you honestly measuring like if are, if you're, are you measuring and it also depends on the type of coffee right like espresso pour over dark roast, roast light roast they oh. all have different caffeine so it is going to be an ish and i'm just here to tell you that an ish is a okay here you yeah. don't have to be measuring out your coffee like and even for me it meant just like not choosing to have an afternoon coffee or like um, maybe you don't get two energy drinks a day when you're pregnant like there's no. little things we can do most people are over consuming caffeine to begin with because it's a question i ask almost every client is like do you drink coffee if so how much just so i can know what's going on with caffeine and most people's version of one cup is far more than an actual cup. Most of our coffee cups are closer to two cups per cup. Um, if you have so like a giant travel mug that you drink out of, like I do. Yeah. If you like have a huge like Yeti or something, you're probably consuming two to three cups yeah. of coffee in one go. So your version of one cup is going to be a little different as well. And I think like, that kind of leads me into something that I wanted to say that is more of a general statement than a specific one is every pregnant person is going to have a different risk assessment. So for example, the coffee, if you're a regular coffee drinker, it's probably not that big of a deal, but if you didn't drink coffee before and now you need to, maybe we keep it at a low amount. The same thing goes for physical activity. So you guys all know, I'm going to, break the podcast world by saying this, I mountain biked until I was like 26 weeks pregnant or a little bit more than that. And for, for a lot of people, mountain biking, very risky activity for myself. I am a pretty accomplished cyclist. If I do say so myself, I felt very comfortable on a bicycle. My midwife was encouraging of the fact that I continued to ride. She just said, don't drop off any cliffs. And I was like, I wouldn't do that anyways. Yeah. And I think and we so, said that with exercise too, like continued exercise, but like maybe now is not the time we're joining a competition. Yeah. So. And there was just a, uh, there was just a reel that was going around Instagram. Um, maybe I'll find it and I'll share it to Jill so she can post it on our account. But a female power lifter did a meet at 30 something weeks pregnant. I think it was 32. Um, I wanted to say 35, but that seems really close to birth. 32 ish we'll say. And, uh, she killed it. It was, it was amazing. So also goes to show you that you can exercise on your back. Yeah. That probably uh, also wasn't didn't. her, her first rodeo. So like we've said, like maybe this isn't the time we first compete ever, but if you've no, been doing she, it, you're fine. She was it. training at an elite level, but that just, yeah. That's the other thing I wanted to say about exercise was that let's say you do have a power lifter who gets pregnant and you tell them you can, you're only allowed to lift like 50 pounds. That is a joke to their body. And not just like, not just like to them being like 50 pounds, but we're going into that thing where is it actually deconditioning to put limits on somebody like that? And the answer is yes. Um, from a physiological point of view, that is absolutely not within their bodies, like, you know, safe risk sort of things. Um, so that's why it is important that people who are pregnant, who are athletes, get 
specific coaching for the type of sport that they do um, if they would like to continue doing what they love. Um, Your body's used to far. It's the same one. Doctors are like, oh, don't lift more than 20 pounds. I'm like, do we realize how little 20 pounds is? Like, that's not getting us very far. Well, the but. thing is, is what's happening is, let's say it's a second pregnancy. You've got a toddler at home who's probably 30 or more pounds. And then you have this little baby. So, yes, you might not be lifting a 20 pound baby, but you're going to be lifting a 30 pound toddler and that baby. So if yeah. you're deconditioned postpartum then you're going to wonder why you have all this pelvic pain, why you have, um, you know, urinary incontinence when you have load, why you have prolapse, like all these things, strength training will support all those things. I'm not saying you can strength train your way out of having pelvic floor symptoms postpartum. I'm saying that people who do strength train do tend to have a lower incidence of things like that. Um, or they are better equipped to manage those kinds of symptoms if and when they do come up. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, you don't have to full stop all your things just because you're with child. It will be okay. Um, the last, like, most common one, I think, for nutrition is the good old deli meats and how we shouldn't ever eat them because they're going to kill us. Because of listeria. Did you know? According to the CDC, speaking of the CDC, we love um, there's a there. higher incidence of listeria in romaine lettuce than there is uh, cold cuts. Wasn't um, that a Costco thing a little while ago in Edmonton was, where like all was, of their like, lettuce went bad? Yeah, lettuce, lettuce gets recalled all the time. Cantaloupe yeah. also gets recalled all the time. Um, and nobody is telling pregnant people to like not eat salad. They're just saying like wash your lettuce and like choose good quality. The same goes for meat. I ate, full disclosure, I'm just, I'm just like going against everything. I ate prosciutto every single day. That I was Ooh, so salty, so nice. Um, I also choose good quality meat. I'm not, if it like, honestly, like do a smell test. Don't, don't eat like, um, you know, don't buy like a six day old sandwich from like 7-Eleven. Like, you know, make good choices. Be a grown up. But like do that um, every day yeah totally that's uh it is still out there like i pulled up the american pregnancy association which i had to because we all know the u.s is a little different than canada yeah. and it still says the safest course of action to protect your baby is to avoid deli meats until after pregnancy mm -hmm. so like that info is still out there and it's still um a thing and i think most common and this is like a better safe than sorry type of thing. Like everything's situational, but most mm -hmm. narratives are going to read that you shouldn't have it or you should avoid it or you should cook it. Um, but again, cooking deli meat. It says cook it until steaming. Um, but I just think, again, it's a risk versus reward. I think the risk around deli meat is so low. And, that, like, and, and truly, it's just that like... I don't even think it was the actual, um, the actual like listeria that can like hurt you. It's that you will just get so sick and um, like, what am I trying to say? So it's sick and like- sickness that has the- the sickness, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you're looking for extra um, research on things like that, um, I read a really good book during pregnancy um, it's by Emily Oster, and I can't remember what the pregnancy one is called. I can only remember the newborn one right, or the ki the baby one right now. But it's uh, expecting better. That's what it's called. She is a economist who deals with statistics and things for a living, and she took a lot of these things, and um, like the eating, the you know that kind of thing that you're told not to do when you're pregnant. Her stuff about um, exercise is a little outdated. Um, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. She also mentions Kegels and things. So like, we can just ignore that. You guys know that. Um, not that Kegels are bad. They're just not the only thing. Um, but that is a really great book about those kind of statistics. If you're interested in learning the facts about listeria and things like that, um, like deli meat, coffee, those kinds of things. She did a really good job of those, which is why I chose that it would be in my safe circle to continue to eat deli meat and drink coffee. Yeah. And it does say, it says pregnant women are more likely 
to get listeriosis than the general population. But like we said, it says vomiting and diarrhea can cause the body to lose too much water. So the dehydration is more of the issue <laughs> than the actual than the actual listeria. Yeah, the actual like disease or whatever, the sickness is not going to harm your baby. It's the fact that you'll be very dehydrated and out of Which condition. you would be if you were thrown up from the flu also. So or hyperemesis. Yeah. So <laughs> um but I think that's a good place to kind of wrap it up. We did some really basic that was all of them, right? Yeah. We did some really basic myths. Um we got some but new I also information think- out there. I also think these are the narrative we hear all the time as coaches, as humans, as people like these are the most common or like if you're pregnant and drinking a coffee, someone's going to be like, oh, you shouldn't be drinking that. So I think it's always helpful to like know your facts um, so that I mean, you don't have to justify shit to anyone, but so that if you are feeling a little feisty that day, you can be like, actually, according to research, you can shut up. That would be my approach. Or (laughs) you can do what I did. I was buying a coffee at about, I don't know, 30 weeks pregnant. So very pregnant. And somebody said, you shouldn't be drinking that. And I was like, oh, why? And they said, because you're pregnant. And I said, I'm not pregnant. And I walked away. Um, very so pregnant. you could just do that too. That was my favorite game to play because your body is no one else's business. Yes. Um but so. I mean, you, I feel like people hearing that, if you've never heard me tell that story before, you're probably like, yeah, you would say something like that. And it's uh, the same. You, I don't know if you saw it was circulating the internet, that news reporter, um, somebody like emailed oh, her and asked her, she was, asked if she was pregnant. And she was like, actually, I lost my uterus five years ago um, to like cancer. And this is just what 50 year old women look like. like. So yeah. thanks so much for that. So um, I hope you stand your ground if anyone chooses to comment on what you choose to do with your life and your body. Um, but I hope we can help to give you some knowledge and some backup. So if there's any other pregnancy things that have come up, any myths you've heard, or you're like, I'm really panicking about this, uh, let us know and we would be happy to dive into it, and give you the rundown. Um, And let's open up the floor to if you have any postpartum questions, because I'm sure we will do an episode on some postpartum stuff in either like next time we record or in a couple weeks, give you a little break from the baby talk. Um, And if you have any questions that you want us to answer about postpartum or even um, I can do my best to answer like parenting questions. But honestly, I don't know what I'm doing. So um, I can try. Uh, Yeah. But (laughs) If you need, like, if you're like, oh, my friend is pregnant or I want to be pregnant and I don't know what to do, I don't know where to start, I don't talk about it as much just because it's not my main selling point as a coach. But, like, both of us are very qualified to work with pre and postnatal women um, at any stage. So you can come here and we can point you in the right direction or we can give you the info or whatever it may be. So if you have friends that are freaking out, send them this way, send them the podcast. Um, We appreciate when you share it and yeah, I'll throw a question box up when it goes up and you can pop any questions you have in there. Yeah. And if you're looking to follow us over on Instagram, if you're not already, it's at Lattes and Lifting Podcast, same handle on uh, the YouTube. If you want to go watch us instead, um, we're not going to try and we're not going to start putting ourselves together for this, the holiday episode. But you can see my cute new mic if you go to the I'm actually YouTube. i actually really prefer that one jill so maybe what we'll do is we'll have like a six month sort of rotation I'm just kidding <laughs> like, since, since they're our microphone <laughs> shout out to <laughs> melissa because she told me to buy a microphone a long time ago so here we are yes um our sp- sponsored was that i was gonna say it was that the person who sent us yeah. coffee money sponsored. yeah so if you remember like our first youtube episode or first or second YouTube episode, um, we finally decided what to do with our budget. Uh, We did buy coffees a couple times, but we decided that if we both had really great microphones, we could do better for you guys. So we're just reinvesting. So thanks, Melissa, our first sponsor, um, personally. Rock. Um, Um, (laughs) You can find me at coachjail.april on Instagram and the good old TikTok. And you can find me at JLAC Fitness on all the socials. I'm going to catch you guys next time. Bye.